lovely feedback to the readers. Um, and that would be really welcome. That's a nice thing to do. And we'll, we can save that at the end. And the chat will also be used to pop in links to readers, books, or their social media channels. So um, I'm just going to break the ice with a very short poem. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Gaynor Cain. I'm an East Belfast poet. I've been writing for about five or six years now. And, um, oh, I, I'm not supposed to do my, <laughs> my writer's introduction. I'm going to do my funny one. Um, so yeah, I've applied for loads of different jobs in the past. I have had interviews for lab technician, for a curator in the Ulster Museum and they asked me would I like to work on the mummy. I didn't get the job. Um, I've also worked in the greenhouse of B&Q and been a survey interviewer for NISRA. And I've done a Sarabini impersonation and had a go at Property Ladder. So I'm just going to get, read a poem um, about the early aviatrixes and how brave they were. Um, and it's from my little mini collection, Circle in the Sun. It's called The Linguistics of High Flying Fashion. First, they were tongue-tied by men, the mechanics, fathers, brothers, husbands, body language bound, no free speech or lone flights. Patwa pinched, clipped, nipped at the ankles, skirts clenched at the hem, pull tight, bowed, forced to hobble in a geisha like gait. Next came knickerbockers, convertible culottes and quilted satin the colour of Victoria plums. With a twirl, it became a dress of discourse, thick belts, corset tight, wasp waisted women. But gradually, one syllable and flying vernacular at a time, they learned how to say goodbye to skirts. Thank you. So our real first, that was just a wee icebreaker. Our um, proper first reader is Betty Lee. Betty spends her time watching the birds in her garden when she should be writing snappy bios. She's such a chatterbox that having only 50 words leaves her a bit stunned as to what to say. That's why her last novel writing adventure ended up as a trilogy. Can we all welcome Betty Lee to read? That's she. Yay. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Gaynor. Um, and it's uh, it's so exciting to be here and to see all the faces. Oh my goodness, so many people in one place. I'm a bit overwhelmed. Um, so we're here to celebrate women. And so I actually decided to write uh, or to read something from my first book, March to November. Um, and it's just a little piece about um, what Wani does best, women supporting each other, basically. So um, Wani being women allowed, and I. Fran pulled open the fridge, its light brightening the gloom a little. Jesus, Molly, what's all this? It's just food my cousin brought round. Molly sat down heavily on a kitchen chair, propped an elbow on the table and rested her head on her hand. Fran lifted plates of food out of the fridge, peeling back the cellophane and sniffing them. Phew, how long's that been there? Fran screwed up her face and looked around at Molly. Well, Molly's eyes filled with tears. I can't, I just can't eat, Molly said. Tears flowed down her cheeks unchecked. My mother was right. I should have seen it all coming. Molly scrunched her eyes closed and brought her hands to her face. She sat trembling. Fran moved to her side and put her arm around Molly's shoulder. She cleared her throat. 
When my Anthony died, I wanted to lie down and die too. But life's not like that. We don't have the choice in these things. You need to buck up, get angry, stop lying down and taking all this. Molly looked up at Fran, astonished. But Fran stirred into some space above her head. I got so angry. Angry at him for jumping in the feckin' lagging. Bloody Egypt could hardly swim the length of himself. And I hated that little girl. I hated her parents. I blamed them for her falling in the damn river in the first place. And I hated all the years we'd lost. All that time I wouldn't be able to share with Anthony. I'm so sorry you lost him. But at least you know he loved you, Molly said quietly. I, well, Dermot doesn't love me anymore, Molly said. The words nearly choked her. When did he stop? Why didn't I notice? I feel so stupid, Fran. Molly hung her head. You aren't the first or the last woman to be duped like this. You have to pull yourself together. So you couldn't keep your pooch on the porch. You'll just have to train the next one better. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. That was fantastic. Now, we're going to move on to Kelly Crichton. Kelly was never really a party animal, but boy, let me tell you, when this thing is over, when life gets back to normal, Kelly Crichton, Crichton is going to probably stay in and watch TV and read. That's all welcome, Kelly, to read. Thank you very much, Gainer. And thank you for organising this evening. It's just lovely to see everybody's faces and hear these voices again. I'm going to read, this is the first outing of my new short story collection. Everybody's happy. It will be out in May. It's available for pre-order at the minute. This is quite a satirical story about a young student who is contemplating suing a lecturer of hers for boring her to sleep during classes. Clover Morris renamed the museum, the Men's Museum of Looking Back. Clover wasn't being sexist with the name as the building only contained artifacts pertaining to males. A visitor from Mars would have thought that women were as alien to this place as they themselves were. Barely anybody visited the museum during that period. Most people made a good attempt to only look forward. So Clover Morris closed the place down, declaring that there would be no more toxic looking back, and she made the premises the HQ for the WAB, the Women's Advice Bureau. Taking a step back, she left Pin Greer to steer the Bureau onward, which brings us up to today and makes me think about her most recent interview, in which Clover states that at one stage in her life in Parliament got so boring that she considered taking her own life. I'm happy to say that this no longer occurs to any women here, but the rates for men bad as they already were have now hit endemic proportions. And no one wants to say that, I believe. Not if the human race should hope to go on. And I believe we wanted to. My good friend April May reminded me recently that there are still plenty of men left in developing countries and that they are not burdened by the issues the men from here are. No, of course they have their own, was my conclusion. April May says she read somewhere that should we feel the need to procreate, as is often the urge in women who do not fear raising boys to be looking forward men, then there could always be love holidays to developing countries. She had spoken to someone who had spoken to someone who had read in the grapevine that the WAB is already hot-footing the idea of love holidays with an action plan, male screening service and government funding. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much. Now we are going to move on to Fiona Aurora. 
Fiona is from Larne. She writes social realism with gallows humour and the odd piece of time travel. In childhood, she believed the draft under the door was the giraffe under the door. And she often harvests from her own mistakes for fictional exploration. Reading from her work in post pro, pro <laughs> work in progress. <laughs> oh dear. I'm more in these teeth for somebody else. Take me to Palestine straight. I feel thanks. Thanks, Gaynor, for organizing all this. And thanks everyone for listening. And this is just a wee snippet from one of the stories in Take Me to Palestine Street, and it's Gina's story, and she's on her way to the Holy Lands here. But Gina's on the move, feet skimming concrete stairs, out the door fast as a half brick towards a Land Rover, angling for a family saloon, a Volvo maybe, something not to be torched at the end, but to be left back gently outside its owner's house. Gina first allowed self to be carried when she was size enough to span a back window, sandbagging a Fiat 132, a gorgeous magic tree, dream of a car with smooth electric windows and suede rich upholstery. Lads reckoned the Brits would not shoot a win, and even better if it were a girl. If they were caught, the soldiers would go easy on the hoods in front of a wee girl. Promotion came the day she learned to slide her arm into the small gap of a driver's side window, to pull up the lock button and open the door, to weak out the headrest and sit in it for height, to break the steering column and know which wires to fizz and fire the heart-wrenching cough of ignition. Lately, she's been allowing self to be deliberately caught while tiring this addiction, not the same fun at the dreary age of 20, never mind the summons by the punishment squad who only let her off on account of her uncle. Truth be told, she secretly angles to handbrake turn across her brother's Land Rover path. He's a cop now and Gina is scundering the hell out of him, but she likes to catch a glimpse of the bright eyes, just like the black and white memory of her dad. Can you have bright eyes in a black and white photo? She believes there is a face-to-face -face memory from babyhood, but she never told a sinner or she'd be laughed out of town. The imaginary eyes grew brighter from childhood to teenagehood, and she reckoned that from his grave, he was proud in the way that one of her friend's fathers used to boast that his son started on the fags from he was 10, the hardy wee buck. She built this nugget up to her deckening. She was the best car thief, queen of the hoods. Gina runs over the bridge onwards to familiar red brick streets. She can find the house with her eyes closed, whether on foot or behind a wheel. Sure, there's plenty to choose from if she was after any old spin. She can tell the cars of the Holy Joes. They have no rubbish, no radio cassette player. They keep hymn books on their dashboards. The ones with kids have sweetie rubbish clogging the ashtrays, ladybird books abandoned on the back seat. She loves those cars the best, the reliable family saloons. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. So now we move on to Cathy Carson. Cathy Carson is a nurse, a counsellor, a spoken word performer. She used to be a break dancer, but due to old age these days, she's happier putting words on the page than pulling shapes on the stage. Let's welcome Cathy to read. Thank you, Gainer, and thanks, Rachel, for all the great work in the tech as well, and to the audience that's given up their Saturday night for us. Thank you. This little piece is called Nightingale, and it's about COVID nursing. I am not. I make you better, nurse. And you don't want me at your RTA. You see, I'm a palliative trained cancer nurse. I hold your hand as you pass away, but this... This isn't nursing as I know it. This is like training for the SAS. I am so far from my comfort zone. I've never been so stressed. And all day long, I shout at colleagues through a face shield, through a mask. My name is written on my apron because there isn't time to ask. And two weeks ago, we told you that you might not make it through. But before we placed you on a ventilator, this maze of wires and leaves and tubes, you messaged and phoned your loved ones. 
and you thank them for being in your life. Your voice, a ragged whisper as you said goodbye to your wife, but your battery ran out of charge and we were running out of time. So I wrapped my phone in plastic and I told you, please use mine. I'm looking after you today. God, I feel like I could drown. I'm trying to force compassion through this face shield mask and gown and every layer builds a barrier. I have no idea how to climb. I want to rip these gloves off so I can feel your hands and mine. I want to stop the incessant beeping, the hiss and wheeze of these machines that turning you on your front in bed and the hope that you can breathe and your family should be here right now. I should not be standing in this space because no matter how hard or how much I care, I can never take their place and my heart and my spirit are broken. And my hands, my feet, my face are sore. And every night the same bitter prayer, please don't make me do this anymore. And they turned off your machine today. And I pulled your curtains round and watched your chest rise up and fall. God, I tuned out all the sound and thought, I am not a make you better nurse. And you don't want me at your RTA. But I am a palliative trained cancer nurse. So I held your hand as you passed away. Thanks, Gainer. Thank you, Kathy. Oh, um, now we move to Meg McCleary. Meg hails from Belfast, but is living at the seaside now, where she enjoys breezy coastal walks when she gets the time. She writes mainly poetry, with her work being published in journals and poetry anthologies, and she um, writes fiction and is working on her first murder mystery novel. Let's welcome Meg to read. Hi everyone, how do you follow that? Kathy? thanks Thanks very much, that was beautiful. Um, so on this International Women's Day weekend, um, I'm going to read a poem that I wrote to celebrate my mother. Um, and it's called, You Come to Me in Dreams. You come to me in dreams, little snippets of you. In one, you are throwing your head back and laughing, the way you used to do. Music blares out from the radiogram, the Supremes, the Ronettes, Neil Sedaka, you always had such good taste. You come to me in dreams, all dolled up with your yardly scarlet lips and your hill-toned blonde hair, your white stilettos click clacking expertly along the pavement. Sometimes you've donned your flowery patterned apron and you're cooking by the gas stove. Others, you're sewing at the old treadle singer mending and making do, maternal you. You come to me in dreams, kneeling by the cinders of last night's fire, your Revlon scarlet nails broken and scarred as you rake and clean and leave the black lead shining. You set and light the fire, a homely warmth radiates the room. But mostly you come to me in dreams just watching. A waft of coating a on fills the air, as you stand still with a reassuring approval, as real now as you were then. Thank you. Thank you, Meg, that was lovely. Now we're moving on to Wilma Kenny. Wilma lives in Belfast and she loves to read. She's also been known to binge on Netflix. Well. I think we're all pretty guilty of that these days. These days, she often sits up to the wee early hours. She usually splits her time between Belfast and Girona. I can't wait to get back there. Let's wel welcome Wilma to Ray. Hi, thank you very much for organising this. I'm just going to read two poems that um, I have written recently at a workshop online with Anne-Marie Fife. Trying to keep us all sane. Night times. The river flows under the city while the snowdrops sleep in these times. 
Storm fell trees in the night or a dark kiss. Sleep does not visit. The magpies dance on the red copper pipe. Steal the cat's food in these times. Calm night, I see a figure in the garden. It is the pampas grasses swaying. Hours pass silently. This night has lasted 11 months. Small birds sit on the ledge. We stay at home and drink blood orange gin in the early hours, throats swollen with song. The scarlet poppy will arrive in summer among the wild flowers, robin, thrush and little chaffinch. The quince will blossom, bitter fruit, coral flower, announcing the end of the night. Soon I will open my door to you and we will drink from the wedding crystal. I will sleep a little. We pack our cases and cross borders to another door in another land in these times. And the next poem is called Night Confession After Nighthawks by Edward Hopper. And I wrote it, I was at a workshop, not anyone from here. And there was a lady who was insistent that the woman in the Nighthawks painting was a prostitute because she was wearing red and she was out late at night with two men, old lassie. One day I will return to Girona, fly the cobbled streets, go from plaza to plaza, sip ratafia with the locals, talk of the sedition, the riots on the Ponte Pedra Bridge, wander back in the sultry night to doze in the apartment at Devesa Park beside an open window cooled and sheltered by plain trees. In the morning I will wander to the market, buy bread and oranges, wait for the Lido to close, squealing children, return to shuttered houses. Then I will go over the Pont de Ferro, built by Eiffel before his famed tower, walk along the dried up river Onyar and join my friends in Kukut. Here we will listen to piano, eat tapas, we will drink cerveza fria and toast my dress of Spanish poppy red. I have no confession, priest. I do no wrong. What about you, sir? What is your night confession? Thank you. Thank you, Wilma. Thank you. Now, we are going to move on to Kate O'Shea. Kate has a gift to take moments and sculpt poetry from their essential self. She's an ability to search beyond the surface and unearth magic in her observations and still beings and excavate a sublime intimacy by noting how a banjo resonates, connecting whispers and the shadows of the soul. Welcome, Kitty O'Shea. Who wrote that nonsense? <laughs> Thank you, everybody who organized tonight. It's just wonderful. And this is my first Zoom poetry gig. So uh, I'm just going to jump in with a poem called Lonely Planet. I often wake in the stillness, quietude and wonder, who were you at all? You landed and left, a trail of debris glistening in your wake, my heart in shards. I used to lie prone in practice atop the king-sized bed, watching the night sky. Orion's belt looping around my dreams. It being a gift to dream, travel to new galaxies. How else do we excavate what is written for us in those stars? You used to climb on my back, my strong back. This I adored. Said you reminded me of an Australian tree frog. You lay there, still, whispering many times. What are you watching? The blue black. I would answer back. You proffered a well-versed awareness, Mars, Jupiter, the space station passing, outgoing incoming flights of planes. Once we waited with bated breath, watching for shooting stars. I wished with all my heart to see one, just one. And it did not disappoint when it traveled solo from left to right falling through the August night sky. You taught me it was fine to dance alone, view life through an alternate lens. So when you asked me why I never drew my drapes at the close of day, why they were cast back to the outer reaches of the frame, I answered, so I can watch and sometimes weep 
or oftentimes write and bring to twisted sheets words which land only in the darkness as I lie prone in practice beneath the blue-black universal canopy under which we all dream. Thank you everyone for lending an ear. Have a lovely evening. Thank you, Kate. That was lovely. Thank you. Now we are moving on to Mary Ringland. Mary is a writer of poetry and short fiction, a lover of the great outdoors and quiet contemplation. That was another test for those tapebound garden. Lockdown suits her just fine. She's currently in the process of completing her debut novel, Carla Brady, which is due for publication later this year. By hook or by crook, let's welcome Mary to write. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for organising this Gainer, it's a great event and thanks everybody who's turned up tonight instead of sitting watching their Netflix. <laughs> so thank, <laughs> thank you, I'm going to read, uh, this is my first uh, outing actually, I'm going to read a poem, a lockdown lament called The New Normal. We're getting used to it, the new normal, getting used to an alternative way of going brave soldiers in an unwinnable war, getting used to our lockdown babies, our lockdown deaths, our lockdown weddings, never getting used to our 25 maximum mourner lockdown funerals. Too many funerals without a proper wake, a proper hug, a proper cup of tea, and a generous dollop of good old sympathy. We've become expert at keeping our distance, masters in self-isolation. We fade into quarantine, guzzling caffeine and benzene to help stay serene. Could we ever have foreseen this change to our routine? This mental health meltdown, this latest affliction, our Netflix addiction? Two metres, please, I scowl and sidestep the jogger, leaving a trail of lethal droplets in his wake. Two metres, please, I scowl and sidestep the wild, untamed child, the many asymptomatic grim reaper. Where's her keeper? Two metres, please, I scowl and sidestep the lonely old lady and her deadly brand of friendliness, getting much too close for comfort. Better cost, cut this short. Stay back, stay safe, keep your neighbours safe, I mumble, heart aching for a hug as I wave from the distance. And why? because the vibe is bleak today. There's too much sad news today. The threats abound today. There's people to fear today. Bistic to Zoom today. My pixelated friend fades in and out of focus, shifts around in her virtual background of sun served from palm trees. It helps ease her Zoom disease. But we're happy to see each other. We talk over each other. We lose patience with each other. We lose connection with each other. We sit staring at a blank screen. My neighbour waves from over the hedge. We're happy to see each other. We inch towards each other. We inch away from each other. We become a threat to each other. Threats, they're everywhere. Stay back, I shout at the stressed out postie. That's far enough, I shout at the Tesco delivery man. Leave it there, I shout at the overworked, underpaid white van man. Then I wash the groceries, wash my hands, sanitize the meal, wash my hands, wipe the package and wash my hands. I've touched my face, wash my hands. Did you know that hands can kill? Involuntary suicide, that's what they'll write on the death certificate. But we're all in it together at the end of our tether, going quietly psychotic. The voice in our heads so chillingly hypnotic, crying, screaming, pleading, heart stomping out a rhythm of fear, while we still appear to be full of cheer. But the weary eyes tell a different tale. Eyes above the mask, staring frightened eyes, desperate eyes, angry eyes, tearful eyes, honest eyes, windows to our broken souls. Thank you. Wow, you'll need to catch your breath after that. 
Mary, I was <laughs> asking for you there. Have a wee drink. Um, yeah, you mentioned funerals there. This is just on the side. Um, I was at Roselawn last week for a funeral and I didn't realise that you don't get inside. So the grave and the the wife of the man who'd passed away, she had to stand outside and just watch on a screen. And it, it was just horrendous. Sorry. But, um, so we're going to move on to Linda Hutchinson. Since retiring, Linda enjoys killing people and mostly men, but only in stories. She hasn't tried in real life yet. She also enjoys knitting and writing stories for her grandchildren. Her first historical novel for children is available for publication, just in case there's any agents listening. Welcome, Linda, to read. Thank you. Thanks, Gaynor, and thanks everybody for coming. I celebrate women every day, and if you can see up here, that's a portrait of my mother that was painted by my sister. I wanted them to be here. Anyway, my story is called From This Day Forward. Tears sprang to his soft gray eyes when they met mine. My beautiful baby girl, he whispered, handsome in his good suit. Not anymore, dad. It's time to give me up. My own dress was a simple one, no fuss. One last hug then his arms outstretched. Time to go. I had been instantly entranced by Simon's dark piercing eyes. Ours was a fairy tale romance. He was my Oberon, Merlin, Svengali. Magic days became sparkling nights when his lips, his eyes, his fingers wove spells and enchanted me with their power. I fell completely and joyfully, picturing our path ahead together forever. The next part was inevitable, marriage. He laughed when I mentioned it. Oh no, my dear, don't you know you're not that sort of girl? You're the kind for fun, not for marriage. It was remarkably easy to catch him off balance. I didn't even have to push hard. He looked surprised. He fell completely and entirely, flying on his back, arms flailing, his beautiful face receding until I heard the crunch of body on rocks. I looked down at his twisted limbs as he lay like a broken pu puppet, no longer the master. There was just one more question. In the murder of Simon Baxter, do you plead guilty or not guilty? Thank you. Brilliant, and then I realised what your introduction was all about. You were setting that up lovely. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to move on to Trish Bennett. Trish spent her youth on Wales creating a lifetime of shenanigans to tap into later on when she gave in to the urge to write. She settled in a fee large glade in Fermanagh and writes about the border area where she grew up and the antics of her family and the other creatures in her life. Let's welcome Trish to read. How are you? Can you hear me all right? You can. Good. Um, I'm doing three wee short ones because most of my stuff's very long. So. This one, it's the time of year now where the dandelions are starting to come out. And I wrote this one about this time last year. And it's about my bees. And um, what one of them was at one day on the dandelion when the cat was sniffing it, you know, where. So the honeybees respond to the inquisitive young cat. See this point on my ass? See this? See this? Go on cat. Make my day. Try it. That's right. Freak off. Freak right the way off. That's it. That's all that happens. <laughs> so 
the next one, uh, Maria McManus was doing this thing a few years ago where she asked loads of people to write to uh, fill the void in our Ma Robinson Library. I'm sure loads of you wrote. So at the time I'd written a letter, but only now looking back, it means so much more to me because I miss our Ma. And it's really, I miss the flashing, flash fiction, our Ma and the crack. So that's letter, yeah, letter to our Ma. Dear Arma, I hope you're as lovely as ever. I wish I had more time to get to know you better. I've snapped glimpses of you when I called in this past while at John Hewitt's insistence. John O'Connor demanded I stay one November. And to be honest, I don't remember where else fills my head with so many threads. My computer's full of pictures of all manner of chimneys, gargoyles, tombstones, Celtic crosses, stained glass, smiling faces and steps that help work off feeds of ideas and food. I have to admit, at times I've lost the plot. You'll think it rude when I say I've flashed but in our ma, flashing's the thing to do. <laughs> I have to sign off now, for I feel another flash, another hot flash on its way. I have to write it down before I lose it. Fondest regards, Trish. The last one, we short one, and because it's International Women's Day, and I was supposed to have a women's theme, so this one is, weather forecast for PMS. Starts of calm, some sunshine at times, but changeable. Expect jolts of thunder, prone to outbursts, resulting in localized flooding later. Thanks folks. You never stick to the rules, Dana. Yeah, you didn't expect me to, did you? No, I would have been disappointed. <laughs> We're moving on to Rosemary Tumblesey. So, celebrating International Women's Day 2021, Rosemary has shared with me the fact that she's come to terms with the realization that she can never be a mermaid. She is, has determined to be an awesome woman instead. A poet, playwright, an author, she demonstrates a unique appetite for the arts. Let's welcome Rosemary. Hi. Hello everybody, um, wonderful to be here this evening and it's lovely to see all the faces. Can't wait till we all meet up again. Um, thanks to Genia and Rachel for organizing this and as I say, wonderful to see all the, all the familiar faces. Um, just going to read a short poem for uh, celebrating International Women's Day. Um, it's a piece called Erin's Daughter. We bleed for you, weep for you, lay down prostrate for you, Heave for you, kneel for you, bow and lay low. We keen for you, feel for you, lay down our wombs for you, blood of our blood and flesh of our own. But a new day, a new way, as new lives are dawning, not ruptured and bleeding in gore as before, to stand, speak with eloquence of what abhors and remains, to stand eye to eye in the public domain. For speech, when unsheathed, can harm and disarm you. Speech when unsheathed can lay you down low. Speech when unleashed will the true story unveil. The pen when unsheathed tis mightier than the silver tipped blade of the sword. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Now, we are going to move on to Karen Mooney. A career in human resources management provided preparation for some of Karen's current activities, cats and words. Sometimes they 
Sometimes they hide, reappearing at inappropriate times. Sometimes they scratch, sometimes they purr. Let's welcome Karen. Hello, I hope everybody can hear me. Thanks very much, uh, Gaynor and everybody else involved in organising this evening. And it's lovely to see everyone and to hear all the voices and all the lovely readings have been fantastic. I have two wee ones to read. Uh, the first one, both about strong women. Uh, the first one is about Edith, Lady Londonderry, uh, founder of the Women's Legion. And she used her position as hostess really at the Ards Peninsula home of Mount Stewart and her London home to help forward the um, position of women. And she was a suffragist. And this was written for the uh, Votes for Women Faces of Change, or it should be Faces of Change Votes for Women, but we added in the Voices of Women Aloud. This is called Sending Change at Mount Stewart. A fresh breath within these walls, inhaled through acceptance, exhaled to still dissent, cool heated contentions, making room for change. Halls of history, position, privilege, furnished with persuasion, where righteous truths are laid bare by the season, dressed with poise and traded as views to harness the heart. Elements converse here, a microclimate within which many facets of diverse natures are gathered to relax, resolve, reconcile, to propagate new outlooks with kernels of understanding. Sought out, stripped of position, retitled, plied with enchanting views to transform the horizon. Herbaceous borders were created in this fashion too. Effecting change then and now through a legion of volunteers, making a mark, a difference, shifting borders of mind, providing sanctuary from and for the winds of change, a calm oasis, secure from the locks, ebb and flow, yet reflecting the migratory nature of life of a custodian who recognized the whispering scent of change in a desolate political grassland. Thank you, that's that one. And the next one I'd like to read is about another strong lady who sadly, well, this will tell you the story. It's called Abrisha and it's for my mother. You spill out of pots and beds, seed waves of blue flood my memories. Mum grew you too. Cuttings from the family farm, softened our city borders as you trickled onto the lawn. I'd lift you up if I was on mowing duty, emulating her protective nature. When I first had a garden of my own, carefree on ruly borders, echoed my delight in life until uprooted, then healed in where statement plants and concrete block wall protected a sterile plot. Now, I smile at your undemanding yet willful nature as you run unbridled between the paving and red brick steps at my back door. You complement age-covered pots, even venture inside. Unlike mum, cut down after the first flush in early summer, you bloom again. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. That was lovely. Um, so we're halfway through. If folk would like a comfort break, could you raise your hands? And yeah, Let, let's take five minutes just to um, use the facilities and top up the glasses. I've, I've run out of tonic water um, and it's very important that I get more so that I can carry on introducing people. Um, see you back in five. She's originally from Cyan Mills in Tyrone. This summer, she finishes nearly 30 years in the classroom. And while looking forward to the freedom, she will also miss the energy and inspiration that comes from being with young people every day. Let's welcome Maureen to write. Thanks so much, Gaynor, and thanks to Rachel as well. I'm going to read a poem uh, in honour of my grandmother who was also called Mooring, and it's called Namesake. I'm just reading sections. 
Five things have come to me from you. Your piano, your wedding ring, your love of broad beans in summer, your prayer book and your name. Both of us, I find, on looking at your wedding cert online, saddled with a double M because the priests refused our actual name as not a saint's. So you were Mary Margaret and I Mary something else instead. You died in your sleep when I was 10 of the same disease that took your mother when you were nine, leaving you and four wee brothers the start of service that would subsume your life. You came to the village a bride at 17, remembered as sitting on the windowsill of the small street house, swinging your legs in a gym slip, newly arrived from the convent in Limavady, singing. Your father, the widower, worried that you were marrying too young, asked the advice of another woman who reasoned that if he was a good man who would let you make your own home, then it was the right thing to do. He was a good man. It was to be a house full of music, despite its size, where engineers would stay from Belgium and Belfast, and you would play and sing on piano and accordion by ear, a happy house where everyone would keely there. Number 14 Main Street, from where each day my granddad trooped down the mill lane with men and women in answer to the hooters call, the little house prize. You nursed the ones who reared him till they died. <clears throat> we came to you for lunch from the village school. Irish stew delicious by the window or sweet brown trout, the roe fried caught in the river. You'd hang out clothes on the big shared lines at the backs on the cinder paths, chatting to other women while the children played among the sheets. You are dead now, almost as long as you lived, and I am older than you were then when we thought of you as old. And so your piano sits in my library, needing to be tuned. I wear your ring of old gold and grow my own broad beans. I've lost the veritable panoply of saints you held in your head, and I carry your name, while my cousin wears your face and shocks me with recognition when she comes to the door. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Now, we're going to move on to Nandifa. Nandifa Jola. Nandifa is known as Nandi. She's deaf in one ear, obsessed with colors, handbags and shoes. The last time she was a size eight was when she arrived in Northern Ireland 20 years ago before she does discovered that potato bread was a real thing. Welcome, Nandi, to read. Thank you, Kaina, and thank you to Rachel. Thank you to Women Aloud. And um, yeah, I haven't been called Nandi in a long time. <laughs> I'm just shocked to hear it uh, with my good ear. So I'm gonna start, it's just a small poem uh, that was in the Cup Anthology still. He looks at himself in the mirror. He looks at himself in the mirror, holding a photo taken in 1983, thinking, if only I never hit my wife, I never hit my children. The next poem I'm going to read is uh, one I wrote for International Women's Day, just to challenge resistance. I see you, the tear on your brow, hips full of swing, gaps between your teeth. You come here year after year to this pilgrimage, lining the streets of Belfast. Then the chant starts, the drum beat, one, two, one, two. Your feet begin to twitch like child soldiers gasping. Days like this will return again, you know, like a bird song. Once Mother Nature awakens, so will our grasp 
of this planet. Thank you. Thank you, Nandi. Yes, we all have to choose the challenge. Now we're moving on to Hilary McCollum. In another lifetime, Hilary might have been a vengeance demon, terrorising men who have done women wrong. In this one, she lives by the sea and writes and rants. She's going to be reading from the beginning of her novel and process. Pro progress. I have real difficulties with that word tonight. And that uh, novel is called As a Lover. That's welcome, Hilary. Okay, so hopefully you'll be able to hear me. And thanks very much, Gaynor and Rachel, for organising this. Uh, and I'm just starting at the very beginning. Once upon a time, in a land far and near, there lived an ogre in the body of a man. He roamed far and wide, bent on destruction. Until one day, by the bay of the pig, he heard a young woman singing. She had the voice of a skylark. The man fell in love and the ogre fell asleep. The woman was as generous as butter on a warm scone, as hard working as a farmer at harvest, and as ex exquisite as the sun setting on the sea. Best of all, she saw only the good in people, which is exactly what you need if you're hiding an ogre inside you. The man wooed the woman and made her his wife. The woman came with child. Her belly grew with the promise of the future. She sang to the son that she carried inside her of the joy of the world and the love that would surround him. The ogre stirred, but did not wake. The morning began bright with the first push of nature. The waters broke and spilled upon the floor. Through all the day, the woman pushed and sweated and pushed and cried and pushed and screamed. Darkness fell, the baby birthed, a girl, the woman bled and died. The ogre awoke. Chapter one. I read somewhere that life works in seven year cycles. Maybe it's true. I was born in July, 1907. When I was seven, my father took himself away to war and I learned how to breathe. At 14, I started work at the mill and I saw my father with the blood of a dead man on his hands. I'm almost 21. I'm wondering what's ahead. It's my birthday in five days time. I won't celebrate it. I never have. The 27th of July. It's the day my mother died. I killed her. That's what my father always said anyway. He said it this Friday, but I won't be there to hear him. I'm far away across the sea. Thanks. Oh, sorry, I'd let it come back there. I was a bit stunned. Wow, Hilary. Um, uh, next, we're going to um, have Laura Burns read for us. Laura lives in Lisburn and um, has come to writing in recent years. And most of her writing is um, either in poetry or prose about loss and mental health. And boy, this last year has given us a lot of right material about loss and mental health. Let's welcome Laura to read. Laura, could you unmute, unmute yourself? Thank you. Okay. Is that me now? Can you hear me now? Yep. Yes, thanks. Okay, I'm just pulling this here up. I, ha I had it all ready and it's disappeared. So I'm just trying to get it pulled back up here again. Here we are. Uh, this is the first poem that I ever wrote. I wrote it two years ago. It's about mental health and it's in two parts. Um, and I wrote it with like two different voices speaking. Um, and I thought I would read it out uh, tonight because with the pandemic, uh, it has brought an awful lot of mental health issues up for people. So here goes. 
dark thoughts fill my mind. I find comfort in them. They expect nothing from me except peace. I feel calm as I allow my thoughts to travel around my mind without any restrictions. There are no no-go areas. I find beauty in the dark, in a stillness. I find tranquility, allowing the dark to take me to its favorite places. I breathe in the dark. The dark is my friend as I feel the calmness trickle through my body. And I think how easy it would be to stay here. But I know I can't. People depend on me not to stay. I open my eyes, feeling lighter for the time I was able to stay in the dark. Looking forward to the next time, I can spend a few moments there. I'm not afraid of the dark. It's my friend. My darling daughter, come out of the dark. It's not safe for you to stay there. The dark is a stealer of souls. He will take you to his favorite places. He takes over your soul and travels without restrictions as he moves through your thoughts. He sprinkles his evil, dressed in velvet. Do not stay in the dark. Prayer is not safe. He promises you peace. But he lies. He will take you for himself. Chocolate flavored tranquility floats through your body, hiding his lies. I'm worried for you. The dark will take you if you stay. Promises draped in peacefulness and calmness, cocooning you, making you feel warm and safe. But he is a stealer of souls. No, my darling daughter, come out of the dark. Follow my light. It is not safe there. The dark is no one's friend. He is the bringer of grief. That's it. Thank you, Laura. Um, there, there'll be videos go out across the Women Allowed social media channels over the next few days of the festival. And one of the questions that members have been asked is why women's writing matters. And I think Laura has shown us a perfect example of why women's writing matters. It allows you the opportunity to deal with subjects that need a spotlight shone on them. So thank you, Laura. Now we're going to move on to Yvonne Boyle. Yvonne is poet, flash fiction writer, great aunt, stand-up comedian, <coughs> photographer, sometimes politician, escaped social worker, retired, but you never really escaped. About to move on to read. Thanks, Gaynor, for hosting and um for and Rachel for the tech uh, support. And lovely to see everybody. And uh, uh, thanks to the audience members who've come, it's lovely to have you. My first poem is called Bayview. There is a warmth in the night's dusk, a woman alone on a bench, but lights gleam from across the bay. A hint of an e evening breeze comes in from the sea. The sunset's fading goals and pinks become carnelian in puddles left from the afternoon storm. She is no longer heart sore. She knows why she has chosen this spot. Held in a moment between stillness and transformation, tomorrow's weather unknown. 
uh, and my second poem um, uh, is called Swimming with My Cousin in the Lake. And thank you to Maura Donaldson's workshop for helping me edit this. But um, it, it's uh, but it's all it's my responsibility. <laughs> so swimming with my cousin in the lake. There were times in childhood when life seemed to fill out all the spaces, rhythm of energy and playfulness. We are walking down through the willow and black walnut trees to the lake by my cousin's house, between St. Lawrence Seaway and Lake Ontario. Your father and aunt swam here, she said. My family and I have swum here every day we could. Swimming with my cousin in the lake, I feel I could not be living life more fully. Everything complete, nothing wasted, freedom, reaching out to the edges. And then a wee short one to finish with. Um, it's a poem from this book, Phenomenal Woman, which was a diverse women project and facilitated by Nandi. So thanks, Nandi. And um, this little poem is based on uh, my bird here. It's called Evolving. A delicate bird, an awesome song, something is evolving. With dinosaur muscle memory, she can now soar. The notes of her heart song are the energy of her fought for flight paths and future landings. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Now we're moving on to Celine Holmes. Celine is a French writer who's lived in Northern Ireland for 10 years. She loves telling stories about what makes us human and believes that writing is neither a hobby nor a career, but an urge from deep within. Here she is with some poetry born out of the lockdown madness. Welcome, Celine. Hello, thank you. Many thanks for posting this and for many thanks to Rachel. So I'm going to read three short poems. The first one um, deals with the um, a topic that I think is still a bit taboo, but needs to be talked about. My womb whips, my womb whips, an empty cradle filled with knots of love and beads of hope, but bled away at night. My arms ache with the weight of your absence and the dull craving that swells my heart in its cage haunts my dreams. I saw my tears together, a pale shroud over my grief and arrived the angel of my soul that never came to be. Um, the second poem is about what lockdown is doing to us. The video call. There's a crack in your voice, the echo of your longing. As your outstretched arms hug the vacant space in front of you. There's a tugging at your heart, ripples of pain. As you end yet another video call, with a forced smile, but swallowed up in a flood of tears. There's a craving stronger than hunger, an uncrushable thirst, as you're deepening in you, as you are being starved of love. And the third poem was written in the midst of the first lockdown uh, for a friend's birthday, and it's a reminder that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. New day at Killary Harbor. At Killary Harbor, the sea yet asleep is still numb by the cold of the night. At Killary Harbor, slowly the day breaks, the sky adorns itself with a pink diadem and the night recedes. Slowly the fjord comes back to life. At Killary Harbor, the mountains wake up from their foggy dreams while beads of dew form on the heather in, in bloom. At Killary Harbor, a golden ray bores through the shadows it's a new day dawning, the night receding. A bird chirps and the air shudders. Everything stretches and widens at Killary Harbor while the day slowly breaks. Thank you. Thank you, Celine. Now we are going to move on to Darlene Corey. 
There's a scruffy Australian feminist who loves dogs, trees, water, synergy, sunshine, and reading like a demon. She writes about women's journeys, courage, and survival. Today, she's reading you a fairy tale. Let's welcome Darling. Hi, folks. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. I feel like I'm part of a sisterhood and a creative community and to be here for IWD, it's, it's fantastic. So um, without further ado, this is my fairy tale. Once upon a time, there was a girl. She lived in a house that was made of mud with two wicked brothers and two ordinary parents and another brother who was also ordinary. This girl loved words. She could not get enough of them. Words that flew out of her mouth, words that flew into her head from the pages of books, words told stories, and she loved stories. She loved discovering them and creating them and telling them. But the wicked brothers did not love words or stories or the girl, and they plotted against her. While her ordinary parents and her ordinary brother were not looking, one brother pressed her deep into the wall of shifting, sliding mud, and the other brother plastered mud up on top and sealed her up inside the wall. Her mouth closed up and all her words and stories got caught in her throat, choking her. No one could hear her when she tried to scream. Not a sound came out. She was trapped there for a long time, soundlessly screaming. No one heard her and no one came to save her. So she broke free of the wall, splintering fragments of mud everywhere and flew to the very top of a great forest. Here there were birds calling and flowers and trees and even lions and tigers prowling nearby. It was very beautiful, but her words and her stories still felt lost to her. Suddenly a wall of fire raged up the hillside higher and higher, and she loved the glow and the heat and the sound of crackling, even though it might kill her. But then water poured down from the skies, the heaviest downpour she'd ever known, and the fire was put out. When she was dry, she sometimes felt like she was disintegrating and parts of her were breaking off and flying away high up into the sky. Other times she felt like she was still trapped back in the earth in the wall of the house she grew up in where her brothers had crushed her. So she flew back to the mud house to get her words back. No one was there. She climbed through the wall that she had blown apart in her escape to the room that was hers. Under the bed was a simple wooden box. Even though it was locked tight, it opened at her touch. And she knew that this box was hers and hers alone, and it would open for no one else in the world. And it had been waiting a long time for the girl to come home and reclaim it. What happened when the box opened was this. All the girl's words and stories came pouring out. They were all still there in the magical box she had created as a child to keep herself safe. She laughed and cried and danced for the sheer joy of it. The girl knew now she was whole again and that she could do anything she wanted to. So she flew away to a place that made her happy, full of love and trees and tigers and lions. And she wrote her stories. And this is one of them. Thank you. Thank you, darling. Um, I'm just going to take a moment just to say Darlene's one of our newest members to Women Allowed and um, it's, it's lovely to have her here tonight but it's also um, a good time to make the point that there's no hierarchy in the organisation. Everyone is, is the same, you know, new members um, get showcased alongside um, old, you know, long-term members and it's it's just a level playing field and everyone is treated the same. So I just wanted to point that out. Before we move on to our next reader, who is Amy Louise Wyatt. Amy is a poet, artist and lecturer from Bangor. When she's not spoiling her son, husband, dog, cat, rabbit and guinea pig rotten, she loves to write about memories, relationships and the unexpected connections found in everyday things. Let's welcome Amy to read. Thanks very much, Gaynor, um, for organising all this tonight and Rachel for all the mega work you're doing in the background. Um, I'm just going to read um, one little short one from the pamphlet and then uh, I'll test out this new one that I've written. So they're both really about hope. Planets. 
I felt too deeply, so they wrapped me in the ether. Each day reached large and desperate into endless black. Plucked a world, pressed it to my lips. Took new planets into me, gave them my sadness. Friend, even in emptiness of space, don't lose hope, for we can find a home for what's been lost. And this is a, a new one. And again, it, it's a hopeful one. Yes. When he next asks you to walk with him and the child you made and the dog you rescued from the animal shelter, say yes. Stop crying in the bathroom as you pull your leggings over your thighs, soft with sitting. Say yes as you drag the prongs of the brush over bleeding coated teeth. Mouth yes, yes, as you breathe so fast that you sit on the bed before stumbling. Yes, 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 when the socks unmatched strangle your ankles or say something, but don't say no. I say, I'll give my anxiety to the silver birches gathered at the edge of the wood. Drop crumbs of self-doubt, leave them for the grubs. Run hands through crisp leaves, unexplained sadness in their veins. With each breath, send those cruel thoughts into a glassy sky. Leave almost everything bad behind and bring myself home. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. I'm just going to give a quick shout out uh, for the Bangor Literary Journal, which um, Amy edits. Um, there's loads of past issues on the, the website if you're stuck for things to read. Um, we're going to move on to Grania Tobin. Grania lives in Newcastle County Down with the lovely Andy who wakes her up in the morning with a big mug, big shipping forecast mug. She's been pursuing her white hair project for 12 tough pandemic-y, pandemic, -y, pandemic -y? I don't know, and is currently selling her latest poetry collection, The Uses of Self Garland House via her Facebook Messenger. Welcome, Grania. Hello, thanks very much, Gaynor and Rachel and everybody for organising this. Um, I'm going to read two poems about women, wee ones. This is from uh, my first book, Van Jacks, and it's about a friend who had two kinds of cancer. And I went to visit her uh, in a, a, an ablation ward where she was having very horrible treatment. She's alive and well. Her three-year-old is now in his 20s. Um, so this is a very old poem, but I know a lot of people who are going through cancer treatment during this pandemic. So it's for all of those women. The kind, nervous one, sealed into his protective suit, gives you the poisoned cup, your dose measured in curies. You put on your old nightshirt in the room where everything you bring must be destroyed. Parts of your body have already been incinerated. No one may touch you. Outside your image moving on a screen, inside your bedside locker sheeted in polythene. Nurses put down food at your door. Now you're rock bound in solitary, governed by the laws of necessity. Read your contaminated book, which will be disposed of later. Do not think. I think I probably have in common with a lot of people that I know about four people who are currently going through this kind of carry on. Best of luck to all of them. The other one is for um, a woman who's pregnant, a woman who's my son's partner. And it's called Amulet. And, you know, people have been talking about fertility and the magic of fertility and its unpredictability and, you know, how 
it's not either valued enough or it's lost mourned enough. So it's called Amulet. Oh, look with kindness on this woman who is cycling at the moment as a double weight on the saddle. This woman who's more than a vessel, though full of every hope, gravid, round, enceinte, encircling, who is carrying our grandchild, whoever he may be, bellied like a sail open to a strong wind, heading towards a new life for all of us. At the online warehouse of Pius Tat, they're keen to sell this magic. For an offering of $17 or more, we will send you a hand-packaged half-ounce bottle of Blessed Mother Oil. She's wheeling forward in full charge of blessings. I shake off the old urge to tie an amulet to her handlebars. Thank you. Thank you, Grania. Now we're moving to Mel Bradley. Mel is a spoken word artist, writer, playwright, theatre maker, media artist and actor, an outspoken queer feminist performer with a candid voice and an unhealthy obsession with the Virgin Mary. A creative genius with the attention span of a gnat. Here's Mel. Hey, um, thanks so much. Uh, thanks to everybody who's hung on for this, for, for, for now. Um, so this piece I'm gonna perform for you is from the my show, uh, For the Love of Mary, um, based on the Virgin Mary. And this piece is the very final piece. And it is um, the, one of the things that kept coming up through all of the conversations that I had was the lack of voice that Mary had. Um, and so this was through all the atrocities that have ever been committed to the women of this country and of the, of the world um, in, the in, in the name of religion and if Mary could speak to them and what would she say? So this is her prayer to the women of Ireland. Dearest women, Fragility only in eggshell prison confines, fabricated from the fallacy of men, father on high, inspiring words and deeds that, uh, inspiring words and deeds, atrocities that perpetuate the shame you carry in my name. Remove me from your likeness, strip me from my womanly nature to hold you in this guise, unnatural. Strictures form to keep you tethered in insecurity, humility, obedience, simplicity of manner, purity unimpeachable, causing no end of pain, whispered in your ears. From you were but a babe, daughters taught from crib to womanhood to fear themselves and each other. Born as vessel, to be broken, reassembled in misshapen form, chattel, ownership, never your own. Barefooted, I am made to stand on serpent's head, to teach you, that I conquered that which you will never show you your deficiencies as role model out of reach. You carry blame in your bodies, sorrow, a river born in your veins, concealment of sex, ensure its protection, kept sacred, given when conquered, worthy champion found. You carry the fault of female nature, our likeness only in purposeful motherhood, Creator, engineer, nurturing bodyguard, biology punished as you beg for forgiveness in fulfillment of your designated role, purified through prayers of onlookers. You have wept for your sisters, taken, made to walk in penance for crimes against their prescribed virtue, and babies torn from their arms and sold or malnourished, discarded in disgrace. They've depicted me in acceptance to show you how to hold submission in your gaze, tranquility and sweetness of heart, endurance through trials, suffering, your legacy. My tears are for you, stolen, my heart pierced and wounded in watchful repose, helpless. I carry the weight of you, complicit in the thrashing of female flesh and severed spirit. Now, I watch you rise, 
slowly awakening from this haze of deception, meet each other in sisterly adoration, journey to, together towards emancipation, reparation for generations soaked in hurt. Healers, warriors, women, thank you so much. Thank you, Mel. Now, we've gone a little bit over time, but if you don't mind, um, I'd love to just read a poem um, before I ask you all to unmute yourself and to give that big round of applause that we talked about earlier. Um, I've changed my mind about what I'm going to read. I'm going to read a little poem um, inspired by my niece and about the bond that we had from very early on when she was just a baby. And it's called Princess of Eiderdown. In your first winter, I guide you into a king-size ocean. You ride the crest of the wave along its middle, waft a white muslin seal, laughing at the breeze, smiling in a yellow dress, golden hair radiant. You are the sun on my horizon. Just as I think you're going to pronounce yourself Princess of Eiderdown in your babble tongue, you discover my hand. Our eyes connect briefly, and although we have different bloodlines, I know we are bound together until the vanishing point. You reach over, clutch my finger in your tiny hand, squeeze tight, strengthen our connection. Then with the nail of your pointing finger, you pensively pick at the white moon rising from my cuticle, exploring life's mysteries. Thank you. So could I ask you all now to unmute yourselves and go wild and crazy to thank all our marvelous readers and the wonderful Rachel Toner who has been spotlighting everybody. <laughs> Doing all the tech in the background. Yay! Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Lovely. That's great. So, thanks to all those people who have stayed for the whole journey that we've taken you through. It's been a real showcase of our talented writers. And I just want to thank you all for being here to support International Women's Day with us. Rachel has put a link in the chat box, which takes you to the Eventbrite page where you'll find the rest of the events on for this festival that, we, um, that the Women Allowed Committee have put together for International Women's Day. And um, I'm just going to check the old script to see if we missed anything. Um, no, no, I put a little survey in if everyone's happy enough to just take it's only two minutes but we're really be really keen to hear your thoughts if that's all right perfect fill the survey in or I'll come looking for you <laughs> <laughs> ladies can we go wild for dinner can we go wild for dinner <laughs> A hundred, <laughs> right? Um, so I think we can we can stay here and have a chat if, if people want to hang about. Um, and uh, if not, um, good night, safe home to the other room or wherever you are going. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, get another wee drink and enjoy the Netflix that you are going to have. Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll look forward to seeing you at all the other events between yeah. now and this is the yeah. end of our first day so on behalf of the board thank you Gainer thank you mm -hmm. everyone for turning up let's enjoy the rest of the festival mm -hmm. well thank done you. everybody it's going to be well done. Well, well done Cheers. fantastic well done thank you <laughs> thank you everybody <laughs> right way home now <laughs>